Everybody, welcome back to D and J's Epic Quest. I am Jay Rule, and joining alongside me here is Derek or Derek Cronus. And today we have Jim with us from Fantasy for the Ages. Good to have you back. What's up, in everybody? It. What's up? <laughs> well, how's it? Uh, how's it going, fellas? You know, going being well. awake for fifteen minutes, it's going pretty good. <laughs> Hey, that's a Saturday for you. Yeah, yeah. It's been a busy week, so I took the opportunity to sleep a little. Good for you. Yeah. There you go. Sleep is, uh, man, you know, when we were younger, I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to nap. Now, as we get older, can I just sleep some more? You know, that's it's not appreciated enough by the young. No. <laughs> well, it's, uh, like two weekends ago, my uh, stepdaughter had a friend over for a sleepover. And they're 14. We got home late anyway. I don't remember what we were doing, but we didn't get home till like 10 o'clock. And it was like a last minute thing to have the friend over. Mm -hmm. And so my wife was like, hey, you guys can't be up all night. (laughs) Because it was like a Thursday night and we still had to work. And they weren't loud or anything, but my wife woke up at five in the morning and they were still awake. And she's like, go to bed. She was not happy. (laughs) (laughs) So... And probably not shocked either, though. (laughs) Not overly much, but... Uh, her dad was picking her up at noon. So she's like, you need to go to bed because your, your dad's getting you at noon. Like you can't be sleeping all day. So, um, it just turns into a bad cycle, especially, you know, school will be starting up in a you know month or so. Yeah. 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 Even my kids, they've been this summer staying up later than I normally would, but you know, they're, they're preteens. So, but this week is going to be back to, Slowly weaning them back down to well, my bedtime is like nine o'clock because school's starting up. Yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, Jim, something we kind of stole from you guys here, I guess, to kind of kick us off. But uh, what have you been reading lately? Ah, well, I have been reading oh, some really good things. Uh, Dust of Dreams. I'm on book nine of this beautiful epic fantasy series. Uh, about 62% in, yeah, about 62%. That's huh. pretty precise. <laughs> There's 62.7. Yeah. Anyways, uh, loving that. Uh, I just started Red Sister, uh, the first book of the Book of the Ancestor by Mark Lawrence. I'd heard good things. It's already amazing. So that that's something I'm enjoying. And I did just complete uh, a reread of The Way of Kings. Book one of the Stormlight Archive, because book five is coming out in December. So Zach and I are doing rereads to try to get ready for it. Have you guys read the Stormlight Archive? I've done the audiobooks for the first three, hmm. and, but that was a while ago, a couple of years. I have not read four yet, Rhythm of War. I got to tell you that this the reread is amazing of those books. The Way of Kings, my first time through it, I was like, eh. The ending was pretty good. <laughs> it was hard to get through. I I stopped at one point and just put it away. I practically DNF'd it. Okay, now rereading it, I'm like, what was wrong with me? You don't have enough context the first time you're reading the book. That's the problem. When you come back and do a reread, just like I'm sure why people love rereading Malazan. 
when you have context and you know what you're experiencing, it's, there's just a totally different feel. And that's what The Way of Kings was. So I look forward to rereading the rest of those. I think I could understand that. I think it's been long enough where I don't really remember much from the book. And if I picked it up and physically held the book versus reading it, it would probably be a very different experience as well, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm also reading uh, the Kumasagi series. It's a self-published bit of fantasy fiction. But that one I feel bad about because I started it and then I really got sucked into Dust of Dreams. So it's been sitting, waiting for me to open the book back up again. Because uh, it, once once you get bitten by Dust of Dreams, it kind of can't stop reading. Interesting. We got a, little while, a little while to get there, but we'll get there. So what are you guys reading besides this? Besides Memory of Ice, I'm only reading right now Alien to Charybdis or Cherubdis. I'm not sure how to say that. I've got about 150 pages left of that, roughly. Nice. Enjoying it. It's uh, written by Alex White. Uh, they wrote Into the Cold Forge. That's the first one in the series. I don't know if there's going to be a third or not. These two definitely tie together, and it's pretty wild. I know, like, zombie stuff is kind of like your thing, and, like, Aliens is like my thing so like i'm super pumped justin and i are gonna go see romulus when it comes out here in like two weeks nice and i just finished that's uh, been a few weeks but i finished the traitors we are and i haven't started a grave for us all yet which is the second book in the series by mike ruberti i've been waiting to finish uh, my aliens book i think before i start that but that'll be the next one i read yeah i think for you aliens whenever you're reading one of those it's like just <sighs> You don't have to work at it. You just jump in and enjoy. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. it. Even the ones that aren't very good, I still like. Just because Exactly. That's why I read so much zombie crap. <laughs> because some of it's not very good, but I'm having fun. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It just hits that mark for you. <laughs> Justin, you still working on Redwall? I am. Um, I've got maybe 50 pages left of the uh, Sable Queen. And then I move on to the last one, which is the Rogue Crew. And I will be done with my Redwall journey. A classic. Yeah, yeah. So I plan on doing like a little, uh, like, you know, those those videos that you see online about ranking, ranking things. I'm going to rank the Redwall books uh, in just like a little side quest episode. Yeah. With well, Derek people journey. love those ranking episodes. Yeah. That's why we yeah. have a lot of them on our channel. Wow. They get great views. <laughs> Do you use the tier maker one? Tier maker one? No. I don't know. I don't know. the The website to me it was like really like I don't know. It felt really scammy, but it was very it was very aligned with the videos that I've seen already as far as like the visuals. So I'm like, okay, well, this is weird, but I guess whatever. <laughs> oh, I think I know what you're talking. Is that like you got like there's like different colors and it's like S A. Must be like superior or something, and then you got ah, A tier, and you know, yeah, just like a letter grade after that. Yeah, I think there's only two books that I would like. None of none of them are like an F to me, but there are a couple that are definitely D's. But the majority of them probably fall in like the C to B range. Well, that's good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that with you because it's been like I want to get all those books again. I think I've just got the first one. I tried reading it to my kids when they were younger, and they just didn't have the patience to sit there and listen to me read. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. I tried to get my kids to read it too. And they were like, ah, I'm good. Guys, the, the trick is you just have to tie them down. And that's when you read, you know, they can't go anywhere. They're buckled in or maybe duct tape, duct tape works. You know? There you go. There you go. Duct Clearly tape. I did it to my son and that's why he loves <laughs> reading. I just duct taped him down. <laughs> Against his will, huh? <laughs> I mean, they 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 read. They just don't read what I like to read. <laughs> so, yeah, I hear you. Well, that was some good stuff there to start off with. Should we kick things off here, Justin? Before we get started in today's episode, we'd like to take a moment to thank and recognize Silverstone's books. Check out their website at silverstonesbooks.com, where they have a large selection of fantasy, sci-fi, and horror books with the option of many signed copies at pretty decent prices. The store carries a large number of indie authors, so help us help them in supporting those self-published authors. Also, they've been gracious enough to give us a promo code for 10% off your next order. That code is DJQuest, so check out their site and pick up a book and save some cash while supporting indie authors. 
Yes, and uh, Jim, I'm assuming you already have Wind and Truth pre-ordered, but anybody oh, who yes. does not, you can pre-order that through Silverstone's books as well. Um, so anybody listening and you haven't and are thinking about it, um, consider Silverstone's and helping them out. It uh, is good for them. Our patrons, in the order of subscription, we have Jan the Picker, Luciana Etrigan, Ryan the Topological, Damien the Rock of Faces, Nate Fiddle Me This, Shield Anvil Dylan, Calvin He Who Witnessed, Livia the Malazan Potato, and Aaron Mott Irregular. And I know I mentioned it last time, uh, Justin, we've got our Shield Anvil. Still still need our Destriant and Mortal Sword. So anybody who wants to assume those titles, feel free. and uh, Or you can have a different title, different name on our Patreon. Uh, Jim, did you order the... The Broken Binding Malzan books? I did not. They look gorgeous. They do look gorgeous. All right, sorry. Chapter 22 epigraph here. Glass is sand and sand is glass. The ant dancing blind is blind ants do. On the lip of the rim and the rim of the lip. White in the night and gray in the day. Smiling spider, she never smiles, but smile she does. Though the ant never sees, blind as it is, and now was. Tales to Scare Children, Malson the Vindictive. It's quite uh, the riddle there. Well, and it does come up in this chapter, so it was it was kind of cool to to have it like directly play into the epigraph, which I don't think does in the nature that it does in this this chapter. So that was cool. Yeah, there's I, yeah, there's a little line in there. I remember that. All right, well, we'll get started here. Section one. The Seer Doman said mindless panic makes her twitch, and lately he thinks it's been excessive. He explained to the Seer, the leader of the Doman was not happy in his reply, shrieking, asking if the Seer Doman thought him blind. The Seer Doman pled back that he knew the Seer was all-knowing. He was only sharing his concern. He can no longer walk and hardly breathes. Talk understood they were describing him, but didn't really remember who he even was. He recalled feeling power long ago. There was a wolf, he thought, trapped in a cage. That cage was him, and it hurts to breathe. But the wolf's howl was silenced. It cannot call. And who would the wolf call? Talk thought about how he had his hand on her shoulder at one point, before they both had been awakened. Tragic that they didn't know how close they were. A seer Doman spoke to the seer, saying his mother's embrace would kill him. Talk. Should he be returned? The seer was in a pissy mood, asking if the seer doman, seer doman assumed to order him. The seer Doman said he did not care to order. The seer called forth Oltentha and told him to look upon the man at his feet. Oltentha said the seer Doman spoke true. The bones were mangled. The seer screamed that he could see that. The seer Doman said to release him from the horror he lived in. The seer said he would not do that. He is his. He needs him. Mother needs him. One of the seer Doman said her love would be fatal. He pissed off the seer, and he asked if he should call for the winged ones. Oltentha said he would do as he wills, and the seer said that was correct. The seer Doman then asked if he should return him to his mother. The seer said, not yet. He is amused by the sight of him. Then he asked for Oltentha's report. Oltentha said the trenches were dug. The enemy would come across the flat to face the city wall, and he would bet his life they wouldn't scout the ridge to the right. The seer asked about the great ravens. If only one of them saw what was happening. Oltentha said the winged ones drove them away, so the enemy's intelligence has been negated. They will let them make camp on the flats, then they will raise up from their hidden positions. The mages will attack from the walls, the winged ones from the sky. Victory will be theirs. The seer said he wanted brood and his hammer delivered to him. The Malazans destroyed. He wants the gray swords. He wants Itkovian. Then he would have a replacement for his mother. If they want mercy for Tak, then bring him Itkovian. Voltentha said it would be as he wills. Tak thought the wolf was dying. The wolf could not breathe. The seer asked Oltentha where the army was, and they told him it had indeed divided. The seer asked if they knew the other cities were dead. They assumed the great ravens had told them, so the seer wanted to know what they were doing. They were unsure, and they didn't want the winged ones getting too close. The seer figured they must have been wary of traps or a sneak attack from behind, but they were fools, still high on their victory from Capistan. Oltentha agreed. Talk that that everyone pays. No one escapes. He thought he was safe. 
The wolf was where he fled to, but the wolf chose the wrong man, the wrong body. And now the matron has him. So much pain, but he has felt her panic. This is what has taken his mind and destroyed him. Talk thought it would have been better if he stayed destroyed and his memories didn't return. Talk wished he could move, but part of him was pinned to the floor. The seer said to salt the bodies. There were plenty of them as scurvy had taken a good number of the tennis gallery. It was all the soldiers could do, collecting the bodies. The seer said he saw in a dream that the, the soldiers would not be affected by the disease. The seer Doman asked why Polio would bless their cause. The seer did not know or care, but their soldiers would be victorious. Once the invaders are destroyed, they can continue their march. Talk thought the Malazans are coming. He began to laugh, growing louder as it continued. The seer asked what Talk thought was so funny. Could he speak? Talk said he speaks, but the seer never hears him, never listens. One arm's host, the deadliest army ever assembled in the Malazan Empire, is coming for you. The seer asked if he should be shaking in his boots. Tok said he could do as he likes, but his mother knew. The seer said he would forgive Tok's ignorance and that she wasn't scared of the soldiers. She may have an ancient fear of Moonspawn, but it must be explained. Moonspawn is now home to the, to the Tyst Andy and their lord, but they do not know its full potential. The Jaghut remember Moonspawn, and he is in possession of the relevant scrolls from Gothos Folly that whisper of the Kachain Naruk, the short tales. The red-headed stepchildren of the matrons. They built vast floating fortresses from where they launched devastating attacks on their long-tailed siblings. In the end they lost, but one fortress remained, abandoned to the winds, and Gothos thought it floated north into the ice of the Jaghut winter. The seer asked if Tok understood. Rake has no idea of its full potential, the full potential of Moonspawn, and even if he did, he has no way to access that power. Mother remembers, or at least part of her does, but she has nothing to fear. Moonspawn is not within 200 leagues of here. The winged ones have looked high and low. There is no trace of it. So it has either fled or has been destroyed. He asked Tok if it wasn't nearly destroyed at Pale. So there's nothing to worry about. The approaching army will be destroyed, and he will feed Tok personally bits of Dujek's flesh. The seer said it was easy to break his spirit. The only salvation he could hope for was from him, and to pray that there was still mercy in his soul. Or if there was any within, the seer said he heard his mother crying and to take Tok back to her. The seer Doman said the matron was chained below. They would leave Tok where she could not reach, bring him food, water, blankets. The matron was always crying. But the seer wouldn't pay attention to her. There are more pressing matters. Tok said, if caught, the seer would have him devoured. The seer Doman said he was devoured long ago. Tok said he was truly sorry. The seer Doman was caught off guard. Tok asked if the sea was still clogged with ice. The seer Doman said, not for a league, but the storm still raged, and the ice still churn churns as if in battle. Could he not hear it? Tok could not. The seer Doman said, from the causeway, it was intense. Tok said he remembered the wind. The seer Doman said it, was, it no longer reaches them. And Tok said, in the matron's cave, there is no wind. Kind of a, a dark and heavy opening here for this first section. Yeah, it was definitely very, very dark and very depressing. But there's a small shining light in here, and that is the seer domain. Which is surprising to me, because I know we kind of had that little bit of compassion a couple chapters ago where, I don't know if it was the same one, but... One of them gave Tak a cloak or a blanket or something. Uh, yeah, I'm assuming it's the same one for sure. So, yeah, it's just, uh, I don't really expect that out of them. They just I assume they're just heartless bastards that <laughs> just kill. No, uh, it's telltale. Even in the worst group, not everybody is the same. That's true. I just, I whenever I think of the Panty and Dome, and I always just think of, like, brainwashed fanatics. <laughs> um just buying into the cause and and there's nothing else and stuff like this just proves me wrong on it so i think i think that that's the hard part but i think as far as the seer domain goes if you remember in that first kind of example of compassion you know he talks about his his father at coral like returning on a boat and his family has all been converted and he's just like peace bye y'all fuck y'all you know and then leaves 
I think maybe then all the actions of his father are making him think a bit. Certainly. I'm I'm definitely enjoying this. I don't I don't know if it's gonna turn out well for the seer domain because it sounds like he's placing Tak in a position where the matron can't squeeze the shit out of him. So I feel like this is likely going to lead to some type of rescue or a, escape or I mean Tak seems to be in very, very terrible condition. So I don't even know if he can even do anything with the separation but i'm curious to see where this goes yeah it sucks to be talk man <laughs> it really does feel for this guy i don't know if it's going to get any better <laughs> yeah I, it's not a great time for him for sure all right well i mean what, what do you got for us derek my my first thought here you know the seer saying he is his he needs him mother needs him and it just really reminded me how similar that seems to like silver fox and the mighty I don't really know why. It just seems like maybe there's some sort of parallel there. I don't know if it really means anything or not. If it's going to go anywhere, but it felt similar to me. Sure. Well, it's it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, they talk about how the matron, the mother, right, the Kachin Jamal, is like screaming and wailing, you know, like in pain. And it's almost kind of funny that that like really reminds me of the women that were following Anister, the women of the Dead Seed, they were almost kind of like this manic, screaming horde, almost like they didn't have any thoughts to themselves. I don't know if I quite... I mean, I could see where your 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 point here about the silver fox and the Maibi, because there's there's definitely some parallels there. But when I when I when I think of the way the matron is behaving, my first thought is going to the women of the Dead Seed, how they right. just kind of scream, you know, like ah. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that, but it makes sense. I don't know. I mean, it, it kind of seems like the Warren of Chaos has a lot to play in here, even though we don't really get a ton of explanation around that. And my guess is that the portal at Morn, where the matron seems to, you know, have been living until she was like released, is the Warren of Chaos and has made her go crazy. Kind of like what we saw with Hairlock in gardens of the moon right yeah anything you can speak to there jim or just uh got us <laughs> tell us to read on and find out yeah <laughs> raffo indeed <laughs> i mean that's that's reassuring honestly like all you had to say is <laughs> raffo because i i am definitely curious as to like the origin of the matron, you know, how she got there and, uh, you know, things like that. So whether all of my specific questions get answered, uh, I guess who knows, but it's reassuring for you to say Rafa. I, I always feel like that kind of at least gets us thinking that we're on the right track and, and maybe we're not, but yeah. Yeah. I, I will tell you that you don't get all the answers you want, but you get some. That's good. That's good. Uh, my next thought here, I was like, winged ones, what the hell are those? And then, you know, a little more reading, and it was the condors. And I remember we heard about the condors before, and I don't remember if they were referred to as the winged ones or not. Um, they weren't. I don't think that they were referred to as the winged ones uh, at that point in time. But I do remember that they were described as reptilian. So my guess is that these are like pteranodons or some type of like flying dinosaur or raptors with wings i mean no swords for wings though no no maybe they're like feathers are like serrated or Dangers. something yeah <laughs> but they are huge and they are nasty the winged ones well i yes. know condors are big birds so mm -hmm. it's kind of funny though that like if you think about it Right. So we've got the winged ones who are essentially working for the seer, who's working for the crippled god, as far as we can surmise. But yet they are going to battle against fragments of the crippled god in the Great Ravens. Isn't that kind of funny and a little bit ironic? Yeah. You know, because it kind of seems like obviously the Great Ravens are something that, uh, are siding with Brood and Anamanda Rake, so to speak, and they like live on the pockets within Moonspawn. And from what we understand from this book is that, you know, they're they're basically pieces of the crippled god from the fall. But yet the seers forces or winged ones essentially will be battling pieces of the crippled god. If I had to assume 
where this head is coming to, that there will be an aerial battle of some type between the winged ones and uh, the great ravens. You look a little confused, Jim. I hadn't... There's no recollection in my head through this point of the great ravens being pieces of the crippled god. That's where my confusion is coming in. I'm like, oh. really? I didn't remember that. What was in this book? Wasn't it just? I mean, we yeah, it was in the it was that. in the prologue. Remember how we were like that was like one of the things that we had guessed. Like gray ravens were born of like the wood pieces wood. that fell from him or something or his blood or something or other. I don't remember exactly how it was, but yeah, because like I know that there was one part in this book where I think it's Crone something about it was like a blood. It was like a mother's milk to her the power or something I, I don't even remember the right the right scene at the moment but insinuated that all right yeah looking I, I went back so i'm looking back there and what i'm reading here is not so much that they they came from uh, the crippled god but they they came from basically creatures who fed on the pieces of the broken God. Ah. And therefore that changed them and they became what they are now. So they're yes. not of him, but they got their, they got what they are from him. Gotcha. Okay. But I'd missed that completely. It hadn't stuck. I, just, I'm looking back going, Oh, look at that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you. And this is a good reason I come on this channel. Uh, you guys teach me things I missed the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I guess there's one thing we can return to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's always taking. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, no, you guys go through it so slowly, so specifically and carefully. You catch things that someone who's just reading more casually will completely miss. All right. Well, I guess still irony nonetheless, as far as, you know, they're battling, I guess, elements of the crippled god. Uh, my next thought here, or talk is thinking, I think I kind of paraphrase this. I think there's more to it, but you know, he thinks that knowledge was no gift and uh, it was dark, but I just, I like that line. You know, sometimes ignorance is bliss, I guess, is another way to, to put that. So, well, especially in the circumstance in which he finds himself, it'd be better to not be cognizant, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like he's having fun. No. Right. Well, and it kind of sounds like uh, the whereas, like when he first became kind of a prisoner of the seer, like he had a lot of hope, you know, and it kind of seems like he's he's feeling some type of ascendant inside of him, which I still have my theories about as to whether he's Tog or not. He kind of like feels like he himself is dying, and therefore, so is the person inside of him or the ascendant inside of him. And so he speculates that this person is dying as well. You know, that knowledge isn't a gift to him because it's really depressing because <laughs> he's in the situation he's in. Right. Yeah. Um, Justin, I feel like, I mean, you know, there's a, I, th I think I came across a spoiler at one point and maybe Jim, I'll message you after we're done to confirm. And I know I haven't said much on it, but I feel like at one point, Justin, I told you it related to talk. Yeah. So Jim, when we're done, I'll I'll send you a message and ask you about it. Maybe it was nothing, but again, it's gonna. It, we're running out of time here for whatever I saw to happen. So I feel like all your spoilers that you run into happen at like the last, the last two chapters. Like the one with Duiker happened, what the chapter before last in Dead House Gates. So, yeah. and you had known about that for months. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my next thought here, we get a name for the other little dinos, I guess, the Kachain uh, Rook. Um, and I just, you know, we get, you know, a little more lore and more history revealed. And it's sometimes it's kind of slow, but it just keeps coming and it just develops this world more and more and more. Um, mm -hmm. It just kind of like leading into my next point here. This like blew my mind so that these these other Kachain creatures created Moonspawn and other similar structures and like the time scale just like blew my mind because it feels like rakes had it forever so it's it's just insane how far back the history goes yeah it it definitely it, you know this this 
whole section I thought was, you know, really, really cool. Not necessarily because of Tak's state of despair, but more just like this part. I thought this was really cool because like, as you were saying, you really kind of get this like phenomena where like, when you look up at the stars, like, you know, that you're looking at light from like 2000 years ago. And like, it's possible that in this current time in 2000 years, when that light hits the next person's eyes, the, the, that moon or that star doesn't even exist anymore, you know? So just kind of like looking up at the stars and just kind of feeling how small you are and how, far away that light is 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 kind of the feeling i got when i read this and it was really kind of it was cool to everything that we know in the very small bits of information like where he says mother remembers you know the jag hut remember right because the jag hut basically did to the to land what the chain did to the jag hut right they i'm assuming that these giant floating mountains were a huge tool in enslaving the jag hut race and to picture that now i mean we've had we've seen moon spawn in action imagine the sky full of these coming at you what a force yeah mm -hmm. they're like mini death stars right yeah pretty much yeah some Just star like star destroyers floating around blowing your shit up that's so Originally, there was a death ray that came out of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of sure. like the mages, though, right? I mean, they're just raining it down on you. Um, those, those were all the points I had. Unless you gentlemen had anything else you wanted to add or talk about here, in this first part. No, no, that's good. No, I thought that that was great. Very thorough. Awesome. All just right. Enough, from what I remember, I I think I don't know. I just really enjoy Lady Envy, and I I uh, I like this section quite a bit. Gotcha. Yeah, it was definitely interesting. I don't know if I really quite connect with Envy the way you do. The way she talks or humor just resonates with me. I don't know. I think it's one of those things where, like, you know, in the beginning, I really enjoyed, like, her sections. But then we went, like, 80% of the rest of the book and, like, didn't get her until lately. So I feel like I've lost a connection with her. Yeah, I, I don't know. I... But I also kind of feel like these last maybe three or four chapters, you know, ever since like the end of the Siege of Capistan, kind of similar to how you felt at the beginning of the book, where it was just kind of like, like very informational and like trudgy kind of like, I'm starting to feel that way in between the, the, the action, you know? Interesting. Uh, it's interesting that we both have the same feeling, just at very different, different points of the book. Yeah. So, I mean, not that, like, again, I'm not enjoying it. I'm definitely enjoying it, but I'm just, like, I think I'm just, like, so excited to see how this ends. <laughs> like, I just wish that it would get there already, you know? <laughs> right. All right. So, section two here. Wood splintered, a sound that trembled through the entire Mechros fragment. Lady Envy paused as she climbed the slope toward the street's ragged end. She sighed in frustration and opened her warren and floated the Mechros towards where Lanas Tog stood. When Envy reached her side, she could clearly see where the sound was of splintering wood was coming from. A big section of ice had collided with the Mechros and was grinding its way along the base. Lady Envy muttered that they were being driven westward. Lana said that regardless, they were headed towards land, and this was sufficient enough. Envy asks the Amas if she has seen their abode yet, as Envy cannot abide discomfort. Lanas did not reply, which caused Envy to say that they, the, the mass, were all alike, as it had taken weeks for Tool to engage in conversation. Lanas asked who is Tool. Envy explains that the last time he, she saw Onus Tulin, he had looked in worse shape than even Lanas had. Lanas explained that she had seen him once, and Envy guessed that it was at the first gathering. Alana said that this was correct and explained he spoke against the ritual. Envy wondered if this was meant that Lanas hated Tool. The Talani Mass said she didn't hate him, but at that time had disagreed with him, and that, in fact, everyone did. But Tool finally accepted without protest. It was a common belief. Envy asked what was. Lanas explained that the weight of numbers that what the majority believed to be right must be so. 
She explains that when she sees him again, she will tell him that he was the one that was right. Envy tells her that she thinks Tool doesn't hold a grudge about that. She off. She then tells her of another conversation she had with Mock about why he and his brother didn't challenge her as they did with Tool. And it turns out the Segula won't fight women, unless attacked first. Lana said she had no reason to, but asked if she needed to find one. Envy explained that Tool had taken down both Sanu and Thrul. Mach, he was probably equal to Tool, but unless Lonas could match Tool the first sword, she suggested that she should not, so that the Talan message could be delivered. Lonas simply shrugged. Envy gets frustrated at this and states that she wasn't sure what was more depressing than this conversation or conversing with the Segula, not to mention she can't even look into the eyes of the suffering wolf. Lanas explains that the eye has awakened. Envy says that she knows, as it co couldn't have been fun for the not-quite-mortal goddess residing within her. The Amass wonders who has given this beast that gift. Envy shrugged and said it was a misguided sibling who thought he was being kind. She said that this explanation was too simple and explained that her sibling had found the eye damaged from the fall. She needed a warm-blooded place to lay her spirit. Worse yet was that she was the last one left on the entire continent. Lana said that her, Envy's, sibling had misplaced sense of mercy. Envy said that she agreed, and now they have something in common. After studying the Amass, Envy's feelings of pleasure drained away and muttered what a distressing truth that was. Lana's Tog said that most truths were that way. Envy ran her hands through her hair and said that she was going to stare into the eyes of a depressed wolf, as this should improve her mood, because at least Tool had a sense of humor. Lanas replied that he was the first sword. Envy muttered under her breath and then made her way back down the street. She paused at the entrance of a house. Out loud, she said that that was quite funny. But like, didn't she kind of like slip or something a little bit? Like, maybe I just interpreted that differently. But I thought she like, you know, like when you step on ice and your foot kind of goes out and you nearly fall. I, I mean, maybe I thought that's what was going on. I didn't catch that here or there, but yeah, I didn't catch that. But you, you could be right. I guess the first thing that I had picked out was this word macros. I, I thought it was like a ship at some, at first, but then I'm like. Do I risk typing this into Google? And I did. I risked it. I didn't click the link. I just read the little description in the like search. And apparently these are like floating, floating cities. I didn't again go any further than that. But so it just it made it made this the beginning of this kind of make sense for me visually because it kind of I get the feeling that. Lana's Tog, the Amass, and Envy are on two separate floating islands. And so Envy is using her warning to float her Mekros over to Lana's Tog. I very well could be wrong. I don't know. I just, it was very confusing visually, uh, like this first paragraph. Um, Justin, if you want a really good visual for it, Google the French cover for Memories of Ice. I don't know if you've seen that, Jim. Yeah, the French cool. covers tend to give a lot of spoilers, if I remember right. Oh, really? Depending on which book you're looking at, yeah. Oh. Is it the one? Is it the one that's in the Broken Binding? No, oh. I don't think so. No, I it's guess. it's the French book. If you just Google French book cover for Memories of Ice and like look at the images, is it like the black and white? No, it's uh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's in the Broken Binding. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. I was thinking, no, I don't think that's in the Broken Binding. Subterranean, maybe? Or maybe there's a different version of it. But Gotcha. Okay. All right. I mean, I've seen that image. That totally makes sense. Gotcha. I didn't uh, know if you'd seen it. All right. Fair enough. Okay. I mean, it makes sense now. I, I, I get it. But it's just, you know, when I first read it, I was very visually confused as to what was happening in that first paragraph. I guess my next thought here is that when she's... Just when Monas is, is kind of explaining the first gathering and how Tool had, you know, rejected this idea of becoming immortal and that she explains that when she's going to see him again, she will tell him that he was the one that was right. Even though 
it is a belief amongst that culture that the majority rules, right? You know, we kind of see that in a lot of things. And there's something to be said about the one or few people who go against the majority. That's not really my point. My point was, is I feel like for Lanas to have this realization of such a heavy weight to carry, retrospective is a thing. And being that she's lived as long as she has, fighting endlessly, just hoping and wishing for a release, when that could have happened a long go, a long time ago, had they only listened to Tool. Like, the mass of suffering as a culture would have ceased. It would have never happened had they listened to Tool. Had they taken the thought of saying, hey, you know, the majority feel this way, but why is it this one person doesn't feel that way? They really would have explored that. Maybe they would not be in this situation. Maybe. But where would the rest of the world be then? I don't know. A massless. Could be a good or bad thing, I guess. But, but I mean, think about it. Like, what did an amass do in Gardens of the Moon, right? They released Reyes, a Jag Hut tyrant. If Tool would have been long dead, right? I mean, obviously, there's a possibility that somebody else would have woken him up. But, you know, at the same time, it wouldn't have been Tool. <laughs> sure. Sorry. I think too much. For my own good <laughs> just this envy kind of like poking fun just this not quite mortal goddess residing within ball jag right and obvious and to me this must be fandere tog must be talk is kind of where my thoughts are going especially within these first two sections they both talk about something inside of them some type of ascendant Etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know, even in the first section, when talk is talking about like we even once like I had my hand on her shoulder, and like back then we had not awakened and we did not know that, like, I, I don't know, I think that that's such a you know, a, a lover's a lover's thing, right? Like, you know, when you think about like your love of life's how many times before you guys were in love, you were in the same area or you were at the same event or, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's kind of cool to like talk about your past. And this is kind of like a manifestation of two people being together before they were in love, so to speak, if I'm on the right track there or not, but I still think it's poetic. I'm not going to argue with you, man. <laughs> all right okay all right here's here's the the other stuff envy <laughs> envy shrugged and said that it was a misguided sibling who thought he was being kind okay so just again taking all the pieces that i one remember and two kind of just in limbo in my mind is you know we know through this book that cruel saved ball jag right so does this mean that Envy is Cruel's, Draconis's, and Nightchill's sibling? Because I could have swore that Envy said that she was the daughter of Draconis. I mean, it still makes her a family, but not a sibling. So is she saying sibling as in, like, family, or is she saying sibling as in, like, sibling? I don't know, man. Is one of them, a like, a two truths and a lie type of thing? Like, was Envy not being truthful in the beginning of the book? But I could have swore she said she was Draconis's daughter. And I I believe that's exactly what she said. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why. I don't, I, maybe this is just a misunderstanding of word choice here. But, I mean, I don't know if I would call my extended family siblings. But, I mean, uh, maybe it's it's meant to be subjective. Maybe it's meant to subvert our expectations as Erickson so expertly does sometimes. So I just thought that that was weird because it kind of insinuates that Envy is a sister to Cruel when really it would be her uncle. Anything you can unravel from that, Jim? Um, no, I'm, I'm kind of confused at this. Why they would say sibling. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to do this to you twice. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back to the source. <laughs> Well, if, if so, if Envy was sister to Cruel, then how would she not be an elder god then? I mean, I definitely think she's an elder god. I don't I don't doubt that. I think that she definitely is some type of elder god or goddess. 
she's like, you know, she's casually explaining ball jag to uh, Lana's Tog. And it, again, I don't know if this is just like a subtle word choice or if this is like actually what she meant. Yeah. Cause yeah. like even after that, she explains that her sibling had found the eye damaged from the fall. We'll give Jim a moment here. Probably digs up whatever info he's right because he's he's allowed to to do some Google research, whereas we're we're not. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually I'm just back in the chapter itself. I want I want to see oh. the exact wording again. Oh sure sure. Well I can do that. Okay, so I'm I'm on the spot where it specifically says, "Yeah, Lady Envy shrugged a misguided sibling who thought he was being kind." Yeah, my sibling had found the goddess terribly damaged by the fall and needed a warm-blooded place to lay her spirit, which I'm assuming was within Cruel himself, because he's an anatomical Warren. Cruel is not Lady Envy's sibling. So you think that this is probably just uh, an error in edit, or... Yeah, I don't know. See, that's that's why I wanted to look, because when she just says a misguided sibling, she's not saying in that sentence necessarily that it's her sibling, just a sibling. But then she goes on to say my sibling had found. Right, exactly. That's where it gets, I don't know, I'm confused. <laughs> and I remember, I remember writing this comment and like, wait a minute, in the beginning, when she's saying a misguided sibling, I could see that calling out cruel as being a misguided brother and sister brother of somebody. But then the next line kind of contradicted my thought. And I'm like, wait a minute. I actually wrote this comment twice. And this ended up being the one based on the second sentence. Justin, you should really bookmark this or jot it down. Um, so we can ask Mr. Erickson. I'll do, I'll do it right now. Now, she does have a sibling, but it's not Cruel or Draconis. I mean, do you know Lady Envy's sibling? I don't know if you've met. No, we haven't character. We haven't gotten that far. So when but... she references a sibling, yes, there is a sibling, but it's not the ones you're naming. So we must okay. not have ran across the sibling yet. I don't, yeah. I, I mean, if I had to take a guess, right, like... It's interesting that the character's name is Lady Envy, and usually a common phrase is Envy and Spite. So I would imagine that if there is a sibling to Envy, it's Spite, right? Maybe. Are you looking for an answer? Yes. That's a really good postulation. Okay. All right. So maybe then. Maybe, maybe... But I could have swore that it was explained that Cruel saved Balljag. Like, that's correct, right? Well, that I don't remember at all. So I can't, I'd have to look that up. But maybe again, we're just assuming, we're assuming that it was Cruel when in actuality it was Envy's sibling who saved Balljag. That, that would so solve all this. If that's That would it. solve all this. So, yeah. okay, well then I guess maybe we'll just read on and find out. So we won't ask that question to Erickson, or should we? Uh, I don't know. Up to you. I feel like he's going to be like, you dumbasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Sorry, Jim. Try not to like uh, make you think too much here. I, I will bounce back, though, to confirm that you're not wrong about it was cruel did this with Balljag. Oh, So okay. maybe you do want to ask Erickson, because these don't seem to line up. I'm glad you I'm glad you jotted it down then. Good to know that we have a little bit of clarity on there and and you know, again, maybe that was just an oversight that someone has probably found before. All right. The other ones here is uh it just envy envy drives me crazy with like she just has to have meaningful conversation. I really hope that's not the whole reason why she's driving towards the seer is to like get talk back so she can have a decent conversation again but in the eyes of a she's gonna go stare into the eyes of a depressed wolf as this would improve her mood i don't know i just that didn't it didn't sit well with me because like that's so depressing like i'm gonna it's like schadenfreude right like i'm gonna get pleasure out of someone else's misfortune and i don't i didn't i didn't like that 
I didn't like she's, that from Envy. She's bored, man. There's other ways to entertain yourself. But when you're as old as she is? Uh, that's fair. That's fair. She's probably going to manipulate some things for entertainment purposes. So maybe that is her only reason for maybe wanting to free talk. I don't know if that is her motivation or not, but we're part of it. All right. Last thing is this whole like funny thing at the end. And I know that you touched on a, a little bit, Derek, about her slipping, but and maybe that's just something that I didn't catch. But um, it, I took it as I think she's talking about Lannis Tog's comment about Tool being humorous because he was the first sword. But I still don't get why that would be funny to Envy. Right. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it just felt like a very weird way to leave the, the section. And I'm like, I want to know what's funny. Like, what's funny? <laughs> so maybe this is, again, just something that uh, was over my head because I'm very basic in my humor. You know, dad jokes and poo-poo pee-pee usually are the one that get me to laugh up real, real hard. So... You have to check out Jim's dad's jokes then. <laughs> Definitely. <Please do. laughs> uh, all right. Well, anything else there, Justin, or do you want to move on? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm I'm done. <laughs> you guys can get a, a reprieve from me. <laughs> <laughs> you make us think. <laughs> good. <laughs> you do do a good job at that. And most of the time, Justin, that stuff goes over my head and I don't catch it. So I try. All right. Third section here. Crone hopped about all pissed off while Brood watched. Corlat stood a few paces away from Kalor, while the troops marched off to the left and a herd of Berdrin to the right, though there were less of them as the crossing had claimed a large number of the animals. Their attention had wandered and Crone shrieked, drawing them back in. She yelled at Brood, saying he didn't grasp the gravity of the situation and wanted to know where Rake was. She needed to talk to him and warn him. Brood wanted to know what she would warn him of. The few hundred condors that chased them away? Crone said unknown sorcery hides within them, and they had been deliberately kept away. Kalor said they arrived within sight of Lest. They should just do one thing at a time. Crone asked if he was stupid or something. They were preparing. Kalor cut him off and said of course they were. Crone wanted to know what had happened to Moonspawn. She knows what Rake has planned. Has he succeeded? She could not reach him. No one said anything and Crone figured out they all knew less than she did, and that they were lost. Crone turned to Corlat and said her lord had failed, hadn't he? And he'd taken three quarters of the Tyst Andy with him. Would she be enough? Brood interrupted and said they had asked for a report on the Malazans, not a list of her fears. Crone said the Malazans were marching. What else would they be doing? They are closing in on Seto, which is empty except for some dried up corpses. Kaller said they were moving quick. He thought there might have been some deceit there. Brood said to listen to the bird. They marched faster than expected, but that is all. Brood told Crone to have her kin keep an eye on them. As for Coral, they would deal with that when they arrived at Morik and merge forces. As far as Rake was concerned, he had only told Crone to have faith. Crone did not like this answer. With all this talking, Coralette's attention had again drifted away. It was amazing what love could do. The feeling only grew stronger within her. She wasn't worried about Rake or her kin. If needed, she could reach them via Warren, but she had no strong urge to do so. Everything she wanted was held within one man, a mortal man, a man past his youth and soul tattered with scars. Yet he yielded it to her. She thought that was almost impossible. She realized how important he was when she recalled Rake calling him a friend, for that was rare. In all her time knowing Rake, he had only addressed one other as a friend, and that was Caladan Brood. Despite their thousands of years together and countless fights and battles, there had never been one that was irreversible. She thought that was only possible by the distance they kept and occasionally meeting. She did not think their relationship would ever be broken. She knew Rake and Whiskey Jack had only had a few conversations together, but it was enough to forge a friendship. Corlett did not know... How it was made, all the same, it existed. To the south were the walls of Lest. No signs of repair since the Panians left, and the Rivi had set only a few bones littered the city. Crone said devastation, and this is all they would find on their way to Morik while their alliance fell apart. Brood said that would happen. Crone asked where Silver Fox was. What had happened to the Maivi? 
Why are the Grey Swords so far behind and so eager to split up? Where was Rake? Corlat said he was alive. They were alive. Crone asked if she was sure. She said yes, but wondered if they really were. She could reach out, but she wouldn't do that. They would see what they see at Coral. She hoped Whiskey Jack never releases her from his thoughts. Ah, Corlab. It's, 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 soft, it's yeah. It was funny how like I could I, I can really empathize with Corlat here. Cause like I've had those moments where like, you know, I'm supposed to be attentive to other things, but my mind just wanders on other things. This is totally what's happening to her right now. And it's cute. It's like you take this race that is so like depressed, right? You give one of them hope and all of a sudden she is the minority, right? She no longer feels the way the rest of her culture does. Similar to how Tool felt about the gathering. So what do you think if you think Whiskey Jack is still going to die, what do you think that will do to Corlad? I think that she will just not do what I said, just I said. I think that she'll probably <laughs> just fall back into her old ways. I don't know. You think she'll just be able to forget it and let it go that easily? No, I'm saying that she will just go back to the way she was. The way that her her culture and the Tistandi kind of view life. Just cold and... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, she seems pretty smitten with him, so I, I don't know. I, if Whiskey Jack were to die, I'd, I think she might take it a little harder than you think. Oh, I, I definitely think she, though, you know, Whiskey Jack is going to die no matter what like that because, you know, she's got this lifespan. He's human and he's already an older human. So would it? I don't know. I mean, that's a good point, too. I guess maybe I, I should have rephrased it then. So if he's killed in battle or something before, you know, or to occur naturally, let's say. I don't know. I mean, with, with someone who's lived that long, uh, you know, it almost kind of seems like a thousand years is really short. So if Whiskey Jack only has 10 years left of his before he dies naturally, I'm sure that probably feels like minutes to her. Exactly. Perspective. Yeah. I don't know. I still feel like she'd be sad. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course she would. Very yeah. Long. yeah. But she'd get over it. She'd move on. Yeah. I just, I kind of thought you were saying like she wouldn't care. Justin is kind of what I thought you were going for. I'm like, no, I'm saying that after, after she would grieve, right? Like, obviously, there would be some type of grieving process. I think that she would just go back to where she was prior to meeting Whiskey Jack. Gotcha. All right. That's fair. I got you. Um, I only had a couple points on this section, but my first one here. So he's kind of nonchalant about these condors that chased crone and the other great ravens away so it made me kind of think either brood doesn't know they're working for the seer or if he does he's just keeping it close to his chest and and not letting that secret be known i guess i don't know what you think i mean i think it plays into a lot of what you know whiskey jack and dujek were speculating about as far as this kind of rift between the two you know parlayed armies I think that there's something to do with, with Moonspawn, right? I think that Brood is indifferent because I think that he is confident in what is being planned. And I don't think, I know this book has kind of alluded these last couple of chapters that Rake has taken Moonspawn and abandoned them. But I think that, you know, Moonspawn is hiding somewhere. And will kind of show up like in the nick of time type of thing. I mean, I feel like we have a pretty good idea just from the artwork for these broken binding books. Yep. Yeah. I think that, you know, if the broken binding book has any type of, you know, foreshadowing attached to it, as far as our perspective in this book, is that, you know, Moonspawn's going to rise up from the seas of coral and we won't have to worry about the condors because they will be battling mages on a giant floating mountain so you don't think there's people in a room going hey screw with everybody we'll put this on the cover no (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah yeah exactly well they could but i don't know (laughs) kind of thinking probably not (laughs) it might hurt book sales yeah they probably wouldn't yeah i 
wish that I could make artwork like that, but I just, I never, I didn't practice fantasy art. So I'm trying now. I'm trying now. I want to, um, I mean, Derek, do you remember how, I mean, Jim, did you ever read the Redwall stuff? Long time ago. Do you remember how the main villain in the first Redwall book dies? Clooney the Scourge. Yeah. I'm surprised I remember the name. Yeah. <laughs> well, a bell, a bell falls on him. Okay. That's how he dies. So I want to sculpt like in 3D, like my 3D software, you know, but make it a little bit more dark, right? Because like that's what I like. But I want a bell dropping on this like big giant rat and it, you know, like severs him in two. Oh man. You know? And <laughs> right, like so you just got like, you know, floating bits of two halves of <laughs> this rat. And then you've got, you know, Matthias the warrior like riding the bell, like surfing the bell on the way down. Um <laughs> nice yeah i've been i've been sketching out that scene so i think i got it to where i want it and i'm gonna try sculpting it so nice okay my other point here we already kind of talked about it just i feel like it just it doesn't quite seem like Coralat's character to be you know all lovey-dovey but yet she is here hey you know when cupid hits you with that arrow man boom is that a god in this universe or (laughs) just or is that oh. just uh, natural feelings? Just natural. Okay. All right. It would be interesting. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I, I think that that section, while it makes sense and I can see how it's like playing out in real time. Yeah. I don't know if I really have any other particular questions or comments about it. I'm good with it. We can move on. So shall we continue? Let's yeah. shall. All right. <laughs> Itkovian was riding next to Gruntle and watched two gray swords canter towards the shield anvil and the Destrian. Gruntle asked where they had come from, and he asked if they were delivering news. Itkovian said that it appears that way. Gruntle asked if he wasn't curious as to the news. Instead of riding with his, Gruntle's, riffraff, he starts to make a dad joke about dividing the company, naming one half riff and the other half raff. Stony cuts in to tell them to stow the shit. Itkovian... Gruntle and Stony banter between themselves until she finally leaves, and the two watch as she makes her way towards the other column. Gruntle, after a moment, stated that he wondered what she would hear, and Idkovian agreed. They rode on, their pace was steady. Gruntle's followers were searching an abandoned farmhouse. After some time, Stony came riding back to them. As she approached, Idkovian noted that there was drama in the way she rode. Gruntle took this a different way, and a Covian apologized, wondering if she and Gruntle had, you know. Gruntle said that they had, when they were both drunk. When Stoney finally arrived, they asked her what the news was. She said why in the hell would she tell them? After more banter between the three, they asked her again what new- what the news was. She relents and explains that old friends were riding behind them, about a league back. A bone carriage hauling wagons filled with burnt bodies. Stoney asked if he knew who they were. Gruntle's expression was cold, and asked if Buke was with them. Stoney said that not even his horse was there, so he's either flown or... She wasn't able to finish her sentence as the mortal sword, sword wheeled his horse around and bolted. Itkovian hesitated and found Stoney staring at him, sympathy in her eyes. She asked him to catch up with Gruntle. Itkovian caught up and told Gruntle to slow his life down. Gruntle apologizes and said that there wasn't, there was not heat to his temper these days, which made it that much more deadlier. Itkovian starts to say something about Treach before Gruntle cuts him off and tells him to not even try it. He doesn't give a damn what Treach wants, and that he hates titles, even when he was just a caravan captain. Itkovian asked if he meant to harm these travelers behind them. And Gruntle told him that Itkovian knew these travelers as well. Itkovian asked if he did. Gruntle goes on to explain that he had a friend named Buke. Itkovian recalls his meeting a Buke and tells the mortal sword that he once met Buke. He had sorrow behind his eyes and offered to take his sufferings, to which Buke denied. Gruntle tells Itkovian that he should have done what the new shield anvil had done to Anister, because now the man rides at her side. Idkovian said that Anister was not but a shell, and the pain taken from him has stolen his knowledge. 
Edkovian asked if Gruntle would have liked that to have been Buke's fate, too. Gruntle just grimaced. They crested a hill and had to stop suddenly to avoid hitting Boshelin and, Car- and Corbel Broach's carriage. The cat in Reese's lap got scared and bolted. Reese cursed the cat named Baldarth. Edkovian apologizes for startling him and asked if Reese was hurt. Reese mumbled a bunch of stuff to which Gruntle and Ekovian could only guess as to what he was saying. Reese asked what he wanted. Gruntle asked for the truth of where Buke had gone. Reese explained that the best he could was that Buke had flown away. The truth, or sorry, the carriage door opened and Boshaline poked his head out and asked why they had stopped. Boshaline realized that Gruntle and Ekovian were visiting and asked what they wanted, as his temper was real short lately. Gruntle said nothing, and Boshelaine questioned this. Gruntle explains that he was merely inquiring about Buke. Boshelaine told Gruntle that if he sees Buke again, to tell him that he was fired. Gruntle said that he will do. They converse more about Reese needing to be cared for, as the reason he was talking like an idiot was because he broke another tooth on an olive pit. As Gruntle and Ekovian turned to ride away, Boshelaine said goodbye and they would meet again. Gruntle acknowledges this with a wave of his hand. They rode in silence back to rejoin Trake's followers. After some time, Gruntle was heard laughing. Ekovian wondered why and what was so funny. Gruntle explained that Reese would curse Ekovian's concern for the rest of his days. Ekovian asked if he would not be healed. Gruntle explained that, oh, he would be, but for you to ponder alone... Sometimes the curse is worse than the disease. Hidkovian asked to explain that. Gruntle replied that the next time he saw Reese, you should inquire. And Hidkovian said that he would. So, Justin, he wasn't naming the cat. He was calling oh. them bastards. Oh. But he just, he can't, because his mouth's all messed up. Bastards. Damn it. Yeah. I thought that was the cat's name. <laughs> no, it, it took me a couple times of reading it to, like, figure out everything he was saying because he does a pretty good job of jumbling it up yeah yeah damn it ah now that makes so much more sense i thought we were getting a name for the cat okay well ignore that comment then um sorry to repeat on your no no that's great that's cool i for some reason i didn't realize that until after it had been explained that he broke his tooth on an olive pit or whatever until yeah okay Makes sense. All right. I didn't even say it like bath turds, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you said, to be honest. I don't know why I didn't click in when I read it, but you know. It's all right. It's all good. Funny. That's cool. That's cool shit. All right. Well, the, the first thing, uh, ob- you know, obviously summarizing the banter between Stony, Itkovian, and Gruntle. Would have made the section a lot longer, so I just I've kind of kept that out. But I don't know. I when I read it, I kind of feel like I'm part of the group when they. That's what we come to Malazan for, right? That kind of dialogue. It's all through these books, so yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, as much as I wanted to summarize it, I feel like just making a comment about that and how I felt is more than sufficient. People Mm -hmm. don't need to read. People Listen, don't need me to re Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bathers. <laughs> Just a new bathard. <laughs> one thing that I thought was funny about one particular part of the banter was, you know, Ekovian observing the drama that Stony is like riding her horse with, so to speak. And Gruntle just kind of takes us a different way, saying that, uh, I don't think it's necessarily the horse, but just because of nocturnal activities, which I think is funny. Like, Ekovian's noticing the drama. Gruntle's going, no, she's not riding like that because of the horse. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink, little, nod, nod. Wink, this wink, seems nod, a little cranky wink. for sure, though. Yeah. So maybe they just had drunk, angry sex one time, and yeah, who knows. That's but, how we got those tiger stripes, huh? Mm-hmm. But also... Just of the banter, though, you know, Ekovian is such like a a very serious and like logical character. And for him to kind of almost partake in kind of the messing around, I, I feel like is 
he's becoming like lighter. He's not becoming so serious. And I don't know. It's just kind of refreshing to read. I agree. Don't have anything to add on top of that. Okay. You're right. Ekovian is very serious a character, but you know, he carries a burden yeah. and Gruntle and Stony. They don't, they don't need him. <laughs> they're just, they're good. They're, and so to just be able to hang out and chat a little and, and let their, nature kind of rub off on him a little bit i think it's fun for him yeah it's a break from what he normally has to be right yeah he doesn't have to focus on his burdens right like he can right. get away he can escape the whole you know as stoney is explaining the you know the bone carriage hauling wagons filled with burnt bodies i was like whoosh <laughs> that's a scary thought but also corbel wasn't kidding about following this army south uh when he was explaining to the night of death <laughs> what they planned on doing the following morning so mm-hmm. i mean hey they're you know they're following death right like they get uh another man's junk is someone else's treasure or whatever that saying is <laughs> which is dark here but yeah yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah we kind of off page just based on this comment kind of get that the new shield anvil of the green sword has quote unquote cured Anister of like his despair, right? And you know, curing is probably a poor choice of word, but regardless, it kind of seems that Anister will likely uh, if I had to th- if I had a thought, and I know this next comment about Ekovian saying that Anister was not but a shell, uh, because that pain was taken from him, kind of undermines this next thought, but I think it's kind of poetic, is that uh I could totally see Anister leading the Teneskauri, but just in a less cannibalistic light, um, being that he's been one transformed, the Teneskauri have been like re recruited. Maybe not. Based on Nick Cobian's next sentence, I can I can at least dream. I was really hoping we were gonna see that on page. Yeah, uh, I would assume that being that we got that with Wrath Fenner, that he doesn't need to write that again. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, I still just want the tennis gallery to die. <laughs> You're taking that stance, huh? Hard line, hard line. <laughs> I think that they're 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 you know they're a tool that can be used. Right? They're icky. <laughs> they <laughs> just you. are. They're icky. Kill them all. <laughs> Kill them with fire. Burn them up. No, but, I think there's salvation I, there. I do want to throw something in here, though. You know, the, the shield anvil cured him and and left him kind of a shell of a man. You know, he's, he's not who he was. And it, it proves the truth of Star Trek V. Not a very good movie, but that, that late in the movie where Kirk is literally saying, no, you can't take my pain. I need my pain. It's who I am. It's what makes me, you know, what I am. You can't take away certain elements without totally making you a shell. Right. So, I don't know. I mean, it definitely leaves me curious as to what is will become of Anister. But I, I'm i hoping, unlike Derek here, that there's some salvation there. That he finds something to fill that shell. Well, you you will find out. Good to know. Yeah, I'm going to be like jumping for joy if he kills off all the tennis gallery. <laughs> you will find out. <laughs> you will steal, find out. <laughs> to steal Jim's words. <laughs> <laughs> Still true. Uh, I guess my next thought is that, you know, Reese explains in his very mumbled, broken tooth state that Buke had flown away. And indeed, I hope he's not gone for good. But from what I do remember from the last POV scene that we got him in after the Siege of Capistan, he's like flying above and we kind of get the sense of feeling like he's at peace. And so maybe maybe that is the last time that we'll see of him. But uh, either way, I think that Buke got what he needed. Agreed. And then this comment about Bosch Lane, where he's just like, you know, my temper has been real short lived lately and I, I couldn't help but like giggle at that because after being blown up by quick Ben knocked out by picker and then banished by the night of death, like I would be too, you know, it's just, they've had a very serious of misfortunate events the last few chapters and I'd be pretty pissed off too. Like <laughs> I just want to, 
leave that in the behind. Which is, it's it's funny because, you know, before the Siege of Capistan, you know, I remember this conversation between Buke and Gruntle about how to, like, oh, we shouldn't piss them off because they're a huge threat. And then later on, they just kind of seem to just get kicked around and they don't do anything about it. So, like, how much of a threat are they really? Just saying. My last comment here is about inquiring with Reese about the curse is worse than disease type thing. And again, kind of another chuckle moment uh, Mm -hmm. because what Gruntel means here is that whatever the bag that, you know, Corbel was carrying when Boshlin called him out probably didn't have anything fun in there for Reese's fix. Thinking about this more closely, like this is the third tooth broken by an olive pit. Do you think that Reese is potentially undead in some way? No, I think he's trying to kill himself because he's tired of being with these guys. <laughs> and the the olive pits are poisonous, but he I don't maybe you gotta like break them open to get the poison. I don't know. And he's it's like trying to get that cyanide pill in your mouth, but you can't bite through your fake tooth or whatever. Oh. Uh, that's what I think. Interesting. It's yeah, I don't know. Huh? <laughs> I'm just saying that's a theory. <laughs> that is a theory. I don't know. I just knowing who these guys are. And I'm sure that, like, when we read the Blood Follows novella, maybe there will be some clarity there, because I'm assuming that's probably how everybody meets each other. There will be clarity, yes. So, that'll that'll be fun. But outside of that, I don't have anything more to talk about. All right, this will be my last section, if I remember right. Yep. The smell of smoke hung on the walls, and the stains on the rugs spoke to the slaughter of the acolytes. Call wondered if Hood was happy to have his own servants delivered to him within his own church. It didn't look easy to desecrate a place so devoted to death, but he could feel the coolness and indifference as he sat on the bench. The night of death was preparing a place for the Mybe. It had been three hours since the night of death walked into the room with Mybe and the doors closed behind him. Once Murillo came back to Call, spoke saying the night of death couldn't let go of his swords. Murillo said, what of it? Call said it might take another three hours for him to make a bed. Murillo asked if that was supposed to be funny. Call said he was only trying to be practical. They had brought the Maibi there five days ago, and she had been given a room that had belonged to a ranking priest, as well as unload all of their food and water. Every meal tasted like it was soaked in wine, which reminded of Call of the last two years he had spent as a drunk. He wished he could call that man a stranger, but that's not how things worked. He knew how easy it would be to slip back into it. Call said the ants danced blind. Murillo Murillo didn't know what he was talking about. Call reminded him of the old children's story. Murillo asked if he had lost his mind, and Call said he didn't think so. Murillo said that's just it. He wouldn't even know if he did. Call thought about the poem that was written by the Vindictive, focused again, but on the estate and destroyed him. Before she told him she was carrying his child, he wondered if that child had ever existed. Where others used knives to fight, Simital used lies. There never was an announcement, and it would have been hard to miss, and surely his friends would have told him. Murillo came back, and Call asked for a moment. He wanted to ask a question. Did he ever hear of Simital having a baby? Murillo said that wasn't a question to ask in this temple. Call said he was still asking, and Murillo said he wasn't ready to hear the answer. Call said that wasn't for him to judge. Murillo said he had only heard rumors that after his demise, she made no appearances, which she explained away as mourning. Thought Ralph was keeping an eye on her, so he would know more. Call asked if they had ever talked about what he had seen. Murillo asked in return what Ralph would know of mothering. Call said he should be able to tell if a woman was pregnant or not. Murillo said Ralic wasn't sure. He asked about the estate servants. Any of them given birth? Ralic had never made mention of it. Call was annoyed and said he sure wasn't an observant assassin. Murillo finally snapped and said what he had thought had happened. She had the baby and sent it away somewhere. She wouldn't have abandoned it because then she couldn't use it later as marriage bait. Simital was lowborn. She thinks Simital left it, somewhere nobody would look. Call said it would be almost three years old now. Murillo said, maybe so, maybe so, but they wouldn't have been able to find the child. Call said they would have needed his blood, and then Baruch. Murillo said, sure, they'd bleed him out one night while he was passed out drunk. 
Call asked why they didn't do that. Murillo said back then there really wasn't a point. Call said he had been sober for a few months now, and Murillo told him to go go to Baruch in that case. Call said he would. Murillo told him to chill out. He had known a lot of drunks in his day. While Call looked at a few months of sobriety as an eternity, he saw a man still wiping the puke off his clothes. A man who could easily fall back into the habit, and he didn't want him to push him there. Call said he didn't blame him for the decision he made, but he saw it as a reason he needed to stay clean. Murillo told him he hoped he wasn't thinking he was going to walk into whatever house this child was in and take it away. Call asked why not. It was his, after all. Did Murillo think he wasn't capable of raising a child? Murillo said he knew he couldn't, but if he played his cards right, he could pay to see it grow up with opportunities he never would have had. Call realized he would be a hidden benefactor and called that noble. Murillo said it would be convenient if he was honest. He didn't want to make him more depressed, so they would talk about this another time. They got up, and the doors to the room opened. The night of death emerged and said to bring the woman. The room was ready. Call looked into the room, exclaimed that it was a sarcophagus. Murillo said she wasn't dead yet. She feels fine. She might go for a walk. The night of death only repeated himself. The preparations were complete. Interesting section. The pacing of Murillo in this section gave me anxiety because like the way that I got it is between each conversation that they kind of have with each other, Murillo like steps out of view. Like Call is sitting in kind of a perpendicular hallway as Murillo is like pacing back and forth. And so like the visual of Murillo like going out of sight, coming back into sight like really gave me anxiety uh during this section really huh okay yeah <laughs> yeah i guess i didn't feel that way but no no I'm not, that's okay it just you know i mean clearly Murillo is is nervous and you know call is just he's in you know kind of what Murillo says about like i see someone cleaning off puke you know like call call isn't at the mentality where Murillo is yet because he's sobering you know, so while Murillo is worried about current events, Call is kind of catching up with those current events and recollecting things however long ago, five months ago, which right. makes sense why Murillo seems a little bit annoyed at these questions because it, it's things that he's already processed, he's already gone through, and now he's focused on other things. Yeah, it's it felt kind of weird to be like talking about this, so I don't. I can't believe that Erickson would be writing about this baby and that it's not going to play a role somewhere, but it almost just kind of feels like a little bit to me, like it's kind of like useless information. And I, at the same time, like, I don't think that's going to be the case because I don't just, I don't think he writes that way. I think it's character development is what he's writing here. You know, Call seems very determined to stay sober, which is great, but he's got some questions because... For the two years of his, his drunken stupor, he's been kind of out of the picture on what's been happening. So, um, I guess I, maybe I just don't remember, but I didn't remember hearing she was pregnant in Gardens of the Moon. You're right. I don't think that that was mentioned. Just uh, <laughs> wasn't sure if I would forgotten or not. No, this uh, was definitely new to me too. Okay. Well, I guess I'm glad I'm not the only one that felt that way then. Uh, you know, this comment where calls like, oh, he should be able to tell if a woman's pregnant or not, I mean, it's kind of a dangerous game to play. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. You don't want to be not, I mean, you better be like a more than a hundred percent certain on that. If you're gonna <laughs> As a that. kid, I did that once. When are you having the baby? And she wasn't, she was oh, just heavy. No. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, but my mom was not happy with me. I was like seven. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> At least, you know, that age, it's probably a little bit more forgivable than an adult, but <laughs> just a tad. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and then that, you know, Murillo telling him that, you know, he's, I've seen a lot of drunks, you know, and yeah, you, you think you've been sober forever, but it's only been a couple months. You know, I just see a guy, you know, you're still cleaning the puke out of your face and hair and clothes like, man, you know, just some brutal honesty, kind of harsh, but, uh, you know, but maybe it was well written. That was really yeah. well written. It was. Sometimes you just, you know, you need your friends to 
to be that reality check sometimes. He didn't seem super offended by the statement or anything. No, I think Carl recognizes the friendship that he has. And, you know, I mean, I don't think he's stupid for like not recognizing that he's been out of the picture mentally for the last couple of years. And Marilio is still there. I mean, there are plenty of opportunities where Marilio could have just said, like, I'm fucking done. I can't deal with your shit anymore. You know? Right. Well, we've kind of talked about my last comment there already. Um, the sarcophagus, though, I don't know what the heck that's about. I don't <laughs> I don't know where that's going. I'm surprised the Maibi is still alive at this point in the book. Is this going to be your final resting place or something? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I've, I've already got my, my, my theory. I think that the Maibi was already supposed to die, and Silver Fox saved her with the undead dragon while she was in her dreams and took her someplace else. I think the abyss almost getting her was kind of a personification of her dying. I will say that the whole thing with her is very hard to understand. It just really is. Fair enough. I'm sure that we'll get more and I'm excited to learn more, but yeah, it's, it's, it's got my anxiety. I'm like, can I just find out already? Like, (laughs) you know, but that was, that's all I got here. For my last section, uh, want to wrap this up with your last section, Justin? Yeah, let's wrap it up. So, ankle deep in dust, she trudged along the wasteland, but the lace- wasteland was disintegrating, and along with it, her hunters. She was thankful that these demonic pursuers were gone. What was worse, though, was her sudden realization that she was surrounded by complete emptiness. She felt no grass under her feet and no wind. Even the hum of the backflies, who were so eager to feed on her flesh, even though her scalp still felt as if they were still making homes within her hair, were gone. She felt as if she was weakening, and not because of her muscles, but something breaking down. She was losing her self-worth, and that realization was scaring her. The sky overhead was colorless, no clouds in the sky, and illuminated by some strange, unseen light source. She held her gaze straight ahead. There was nothing to mark the horizon in any direction, and she wondered if she would just end up going in circles. She had no destination in her mind of for her for this journey of spirit. She had no destination in her mind for this journey of spirit. She would even know how, nor the will to seek a destination. Her lungs ached as if they too were losing their ability to function. She believed in a short while that she herself would begin to dissolve. Her body was defeated in a way she thought was opposite of what she feared for so long. The wolves were gone and wouldn't be torn to pe- and she wouldn't be torn to pieces. She realized that it had not seemed that what it was before. Something secret, something of a riddle that she hadn't worked out, but now it was too late. Oblivion had come for her. The abyss she had seen in her nightmares of so long ago had been a place of chaos, a frenzy of feeding souls, unpleasant memories flung by storm winds. Perhaps all that had been a conjuration from her mind, and the true abyss was what she was now seeing, on all sides and in every direction. Something broke the horizon line, something huge and bestial that hadn't been there before. She moaned in terror, even as her steps drew her towards the apparition. It grew with every stride as she got closer, taking up one-third of the sky, a scarred ribcage rising upwards, knotted with malignant growths, porous nodes, cracks, twists, and fissures. Between each bone, skin was stretched, enclosing whatever lay within. Blood vessels spanned the skin, pulsing brighter and dimmer. For this apparition, life was passing, but as for her as well. She asked in a rasping voice if this was hers, and does her heart lie inside? Slowing with each beat, was this her? Emotions struck her suddenly, but not her own. Emotions from whatever lay inside. Emotions of anger and overwhelming pain. She wanted to flee, but but it had sensed her, and it wanted her to stay, and to come closer. Close enough to reach out and touch. The Maibi screamed and fell to her knees, clouds of dust blocking her visions. She felt as if she was being torn apart. Her spirit, 
her instinct of survival clawing, clawing out one more time to resist the summons and to flee. She could not move, though. Then a force reached out and began to pull. On her hands and knees, she looked up through tearful eyes at the scene before her. The ribs were no longer ribs, but legs instead. The skin was no longer skin, but webs, and she was sliding down them. So, when I was summarizing the section, I definitely had a lot more clarity than I did when I first read it, because, like, I summarized it really slow, and I definitely get the picture of some type of dream state, or some type of afterworld, or I almost get kind of a sense of purgatory, based on the way that everything is described here. Mm-hmm. Fever dream. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Exactly. And you can't escape that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But my first thought, as she's talking, she's got no destination in her mind for this journey of spirit, right? I think it's interesting that he uses the word spirit, which kind of maybe plays into my theory and that she's already, like, supposed to be dead. And so now, even though she still exists in the physical world, like, it's more a manifestation of her spirit moving forward. And I don't know, I just kind of got, like, the sense of the environment that she's in. Is this supposed to be, like, the bright light at the end of the tunnel? Or is she potentially in the spirit or in the rivy spirit world or something? I don't I don't really know how to make any sense of that, but those were just kind of my thoughts. I guess I don't really know what to make of that. I know you and I text a little bit. I have a different idea on things, and, and we can talk about that as we get to the end of your points here. But Yeah. The other thing that I thought was just really powerful is just that her young body, because, like, you know, she's young in these dreams, right, was defeated in a way she thought opposite. And she thinks that her youthful body in this spirit slash dream world is the last of her is the last of god what the fuck am i writing basically she assumes that the way that she would have gone out was via the wolves right like being torn to pieces like that has been a fear for her kind of this entire time is being chased being hunted being torn apart but now it seems that her young body is dissolving it's deteriorating it's it's kind of going the way of old age, right? Uh, Which is kind of the opposite of the way that she thought she was going to go out. So I just thought that 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 was really, really powerful way of describing kind of where her head is at. I like it. Nothing for me to add. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll just keep going. So, you know, and even right after that, you know, she's thinking to herself, the, the wolves are gone and she wouldn't be torn to pieces, kind of playing into my last thought. But then she like has this realization that, you know, things didn't seem as they did before. Like she's all of a sudden got some clarity, some secret understanding, like that it's a riddle that she just never worked out before because she was so engrossed in, in running and chasing and, you know, uh, being torn to pieces. And it, it's really got to suck to have that realization now. And what I think she's referring to, what was the riddle, was when, you know, the wolves almost got her, right? Like, they were about to bite down, and then she disappeared. And then, like, a few chapters later, we get Tox's perspective of him chasing her as, like, the lead wolf, right? Because he was supposed to deliver some type of message. And if only she would have known, she could potentially... If if she would have figured out whatever this riddle was, then maybe she wouldn't be in her current situation. You're thinking a lot deeper than I am. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, man. <laughs> but just, you know, towards the end here, where this, like, thing that broke the horizon line, you know, and, and again, the way things are described is, like, there is no horizon. And for this thing to take up one-third of the sky is just puts it into huge perspective. And just fucking massive you know and i I just thought that that was cool my last point here this was probably the most confusing to me because at first i thought that like these these rising rib cages was burn but then i thought it was the crippled god because of the way that the bones were described but then the ribs are just they don't exist they're legs now and what was once skin are now webs and so, like, my only thought now is, like, is this potentially the body of Cruel? You know? Cruel and his Warren. But maybe 
maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. Like I have other parts of this chapter is that maybe it's not meant to be like somebody quote unquote, but maybe this is just actually the personification of death or is this potentially how she envisions hood taking her? Is this a manifestation of how she thinks she should be dying? Like I said, the whole rib part, the overwhelming pain, obviously something is reaching out to her because it's not her emotions. It really confused me. And I don't know if this is like what she's supposed to be doing or if this is she didn't do what she was supposed to do because now she's had that realization that not everything is as it seems before that this is like her consequence for ignoring that. I'm not really sure what to tell you on that just because like I... I had a very different thought on it from you. So just like how this is described, she screamed, fell to her knees. She felt as if she was being torn apart. Her spirit, instinct of survival, clawing out one more time to the re to resist the summons and flee. She could not move, though. It reached out and began to pull. I feel like she's getting stuck in a house of Azath. Interesting. Uh, for, for what purpose? I don't know. But I guess, I mean, you can't, like, unless, I mean, you're just, it's kind of like, I mean, like you, I guess you said, Justin, that's kind of like a purgatory, right? From what I kind of remember in Dead House Gates. Um, I mean, maybe in Dead House Gates, I guess the only recollection I have of the Azath is that there is scenery. Like there was a Knight of Armor that was there. There was, you know, a skeletal remains of a Kachain Chamal. You know, there were all these tiles that led you to different places in the world. You know, I but mean, you, but I, you had like this maze. I guess I'm kind of envisioning a little bit like hedgerows kind of and things stuck in them um, yeah but that was outside of the azath that was like the pathway leading up to the azath is what i thought yep so that wasn't in the azath itself itself correct mm -hmm. so it's potential that like she's stuck outside of an azath in like those in the maze but you got to remember that the azath seeks powerful creatures and i don't necessarily get like i don't see how this would be how the maybe would be high on the houses of Aths list of people to take well i mean maybe she is powerful i mean maybe i mean you're gave, you're not you gave birth to silver fox right i mean she's fairly powerful i don't, I don't know maybe it's a, a bait to get silver fox so that the uh, azath could trade i mean you're not wrong. I'm just extremely skeptical of your theories. <laughs> well, I don't have a lot to like <sighs> stand on with it. It's just like that's when I first read it, I'm like, that's kind of what it feels like to me. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, that's why we have this podcast to talk and discuss, right? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's smiling. I don't know. I you know, I have thoughts I, I can't share. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, just, you're gonna you're gonna feel differently about this entire chapter's conversation later. Okay, <laughs> and you know, like you say, Justin, a lot of times, like whether I'm right or wrong, doesn't yeah. really matter. It's whatever. It's, yeah, it's just kind of when I read it, that's just kind of how I feel, and you know, we'll find more info information out later, and and yeah, I'll probably feel different later. I mean, we are still at the end of the day, first time readers from the series, and we do usually have guests come on that course correct as needed so th that's a good thing that's a good thing you know nothing that you've postulated in this chapter is going to lead you a horribly wrong direction but you know it, if i was to say <laughs> one thing about everything you just said on this chapter is that you probably talked about it a little longer than you needed to <laughs> but i think we do that quite a bit but. <laughs> Which maybe makes those reveals a little underwhelming in retrospective. <laughs> so it is what it is. Well, uh, again, at this point, like, I don't know what I would even try to predict in the next chapter. Um, I know it's a longer one. These next couple are going to probably be a challenge for us. I think they just pretty much get longer till the end of the book at this point. I don't know. I don't know if we'll see the two armies meet back up in this next chapter. I, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I mean, everything seems to be coming to a head. The previous chapter, we had a lot of like ominous undertones. So I, I'm, I'm curious as to where, where it's going to go. But it seems the direction is Coral. I'm sure that there's going to be some type of standoff between 
the two armies and the Panion seer and hopefully some type of resolution to something. One of the many storylines that are happening congruently. Mm -hmm. Well, any, uh, anything else to say about the chapter, Jim? Uh, you guys covered it really well. <laughs> Thank you. I, again, I learned some things. Uh, that was, that was nice. Well, uh, I guess we didn't really give you a chance to do this at the beginning of the episode, but if people aren't following you yet, and they should be, uh, where can they find you? And uh, tell them a little bit about your channel. You shouldn't have right, to do thanks. too much convincing, I don't think, because you guys put out a lot of good stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, our channel is Fantasy for the Ages. It's my son, Zach, and I. I we do some videos together. And then I do a lot by myself because it's my hobby, but he has a life. So he shows up once in a while and we do some good stuff. Uh, we talk about fantasy, science fiction, and other nerdy things that we enjoy. Books, movies, TV, whatever. Uh, we have a whole section that's devoted to reading through the Wheel of Time in a similar manner to what you do here with Malazan, chapter by chapter. And we're on book seven, so about halfway through the series, Wow, which is fantastic. Uh, but there's too much out there to enjoy to only do Wheel of Time. So, yeah, we, we talk about all sorts of different things. We do a lot of uh, book reviews, top 10 lists of favorites, this and that and the other thing. I have a whole thread of dad jokes out there, too, just for the heck of it. Uh, a lot of those are fantasy and science fiction related, kind of bringing it into our content. And then now and then I just throw a random one out. But yeah, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, that's our biggest place. We do port it over to audio, too. So if you prefer just to listen, you can always just get the audio version. And, and Derek makes sure that the right one is uploaded since I had the wrong one the other day. A duplicate, which I fixed because she let me know. Thank you very much. I was surprised nobody else let you know before that. <laughs> well, honestly, most people are following us on YouTube these days. But we do have a small number that continue to... Follow us on Spotify or wherever else they do audio podcasts. And I think you had hopped on it pretty early. And we're on social media, too. We have a Discord server. And we're mostly on X. It's still weird to say that. Uh, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we like to interact with people there. So, yeah, come uh, check out the YouTube channel and see all the stuff that's there. And you'll probably find something you can be entertained with. That's what we're here for. You guys do a good job. I have a lot of fun listening to if it's just you or um, or if it's you and Zach or if you're talking with Spencer or whoever. I've I've listened to most of your stuff. There's only a few things I haven't because spoilers and that type of thing. So Yeah, they come check it out. They'll even get to hear you because you've been on for a couple of episodes there. Yeah, that's true. Well, it was good to have you back. I know we're, we haven't talked about it much lately, but we're still, as we get to the end of the book here, um, we want to do something big for the last chapter, and I'd reached out to you, and um, we'll figure that out here as we get closer and um, release the episodes leading up to that. But uh, get some dramatic readings in again. That's yeah, fun stuff. Absolutely. So hopefully it won't be too long before we have you back again. Great. I'll look forward to it. I as well. Awesome. Well, Justin, I'll probably read for a little bit today here, see how far I get. And uh, yeah, we'll read on and keep finding out, and we'll talk again soon. That's all we can do. There you go. All right, guys. Well, thanks again, Jim. Thanks for, uh, you know, giving us a good couple hours of your day here. We appreciate that and uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.
CNJ's at Big Quest. CNJ's at Big Quest. CNJ's at Big Quest.